Prova, 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 prova.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to all representative board members and national coordinators to this meeting here in Italy, in Rome. So it's an impressive building we are in today. A little different from what we used to have, I would like to say. And uh, I hope you all can hear me. I saw Emma, you were not, not so easy. Maybe they can make a little change on the microphone. Or is it better now? Or you want me to speak even louder? Okay, good. They will fix with the microphone. So, nice to see you here. Wonderful place to be in. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity to give our thanks to Italy, to the Ministry of Education, University and Research for the nice way they have arranged this meeting, especially also the pre-program. It has been a wonderful week for many of us who had the chance to participate. And um, I know that you all have had some very nice, inspiring, impressive days on different places in Italy. So I would like to give all our thanks to Rosario and to Rafael for arranging this wonderful meeting. So please give them our hands. I will just give a quick glance from uh, my participation in Prato and Cortona, which was um, two cities in the Toscana district. And um, we had some wonderful meetings with the teachers, with the students, even with the parents and all the staff. And uh, what is in my mind especially is the way you are taking care of the children and how you have succeeded from the beginning when you changed the law in 1970s and then steps by steps. 1990 you made some crucial decisions also and in 2012, as far as I've been learned during these days. And we can see the result because what is impressing is among many other things the way of um, looking about attitudes. Normally attitudes are very difficult to change in a society. And we know how problematic it can be sometimes to have disabled children in a class, the reactions among peers, among parents, among teachers, among staff, the society. But here we can see that you have really succeeded to involve them, to include them in a real way. And you are very much focusing on how to make a social inclusion in the society. And that's not just for the inclusive in the education in the school. It's just a step for a more social inclusion in the society later on. And it was very, very impressive, I must say, how children take care of each other, how they develop the education, how teachers are working hard with this. And we had one evening where we had a big, let's say, garden party inside, where there were all parents coming, all children, all staff, and we had a nice evening together. And we really can feel how they are taking care of each other in a wonderful way. So I have a feeling when we also saw some of the results from Cortona and had presentations about the structure you are working with, that this is very impressive in many ways. So I, I said in Cortona, you have started to build up an umbrella under which you take care of the children by different experts, by different teachers, but also in the whole way you are looking to education and the approach you are doing. So good luck for your future steps. It was very interesting to take part of this. Many thanks again. Today, we are, um, hopefully, we will see um, the minister later on also. And um, she will not be able to come just now, but uh, hopefully during one of our breaks. So we can start with our um, thematic session about inclusion in higher education. And it will be starting with some presentations. Then we will have a panel and finally a discussion. And all this will be moderated by our director, Mr. Kormeyer. So I will give him the floor. 
Thank you very much. Very warm welcome from my side, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we would like to begin this session with a look at the status quo and progress uh, made regarding inclusion in higher education. And to start with, this type of session has the goal to inform you in, say, a very few hours about the state of the art on, on this area. So very uh, short half a day uh, program where the main developments and, and challenges uh, are being discussed. And when we were reflecting how to, how to set this part of the um, session up, it, it became clear that the Commission showed a very high interest in this topic. So we decided to put a bit more meat on, in the program than we were used to for this type of internal uh, exchanges on a, a topic of interest. Um, firstly, we asked uh, Professor Sheila Riddell from the University of Edinburgh, to, who, is, who is with us today here in Rome. Uh, very war warm welcome, Sheila, from us. I will introduce you a bit uh, later on in a minute. To provide us with an overview of the um, current state of the European policy, the developments and challenges regarding the inclusion of students with disabilities in higher education. So that's, uh, we have asked her to draft a report. Secondly, we have invited uh, some key people who are experts on this area, who I will introduce uh, later on. And finally, we will also draft a report after this meeting with all the conclusions and uh, findings and, and the report that has been made to, to summarize the uh, state of the art on this area and, and then maybe produce it for a wider audience than only internally. So we will make it a bit bigger than we used to do with this type of session. Now we will begin with an overview presentation and then we will have, a, I think, a very interesting dialogue later on. But to begin with, um, I would like to hand the floor to Sheila Riddell from the Center for Research in Education, Inclusion and Diversity from the University of Edinburgh. Um, her research uh, interests are in the broad field of equality and social inclusion, with particular reference to gender, social class, and disability in the fields of education, training, employment, and social care. She will present us the status of accessibility in higher education and uh, the support provisions that are needed and the potentials of open and distance learning and the mobility for learners with special educational needs and or disabilities. Sheila, please, the floor is yours. Well, of course. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's absolutely fantastic to be here in Rome, and I'm only sorry that my visit is curtailed to an arrival yesterday and a departure today. But in any case, it's lovely being here. And I'm going to talk to you today about the work that I've been doing with colleagues on disabled students in higher education in the UK, Scotland, and in the broader European country. Because, of course, we know that the expansion of higher education is seen by the European Union and by member states as the way in which we're going to achieve the knowledge society of the future. And in order to do this, we need to find ways of including more than the typical students. Traditionally, going to university has been the domain of the privileged middle class. But we now have saturated participation across Europe. So almost everybody from a middle class background who wishes to do so has the possibility of going to higher education. In order to widen access, it is recognized that there is a need to attract non-traditional groups, underrepresented students, people who up until now have not had the possibility of achieving higher education. And these movements are really being promoted by, as I've already said, economic, the economics agenda, but also the social justice agenda. And sometimes these things can go hand in hand rather than being in tension with each other. Okay, fine. 
Okay. Um, the structure of what I am going to talk about today, I always think it's quite handy to have a structure so I can remember where I'm meant to be going next. Uh, first of all, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of European policy on widening access. I'm going to talk a little bit about the construction of disability and national participation rates because, of course, one of the difficulties of comparing across countries is that countries actually have different understandings of what counts as an impairment, what counts as disability. I'm going to be saying a little bit about contrasting approaches in the UK and Sweden, both of which are countries which have had a very big commitment to including disabled students and putting in place the type of support that they need. I'm then going to talk about the social characteristics of disabled students in the UK and Scotland, looking a in a little bit more depth at some of the intersectional ana analysis that we need to do. So I believe very strongly that we shouldn't just look at disability. We should also be looking at the way in which disability intersects with social class, gender, ethnicity and so on. And I'm actually going to be talking more about disability and social class here, but the other social variables are of course equally important. I haven't, I'm not going to have enough time to go into case studies I realise in any depth, but I'm just going to mention the couple of experiences to remind you of what this means for people in the real world. So first of all, and again, I don't need to talk too much about this, because if there is one thing that Europe has, it is plenty of policy statements. We are not short of very bold policy rhetoric in this area. Um, in the area of widening access, we of course have the Bologna process and its social dimension, which has developed from 2001 onwards, with its focus on both getting more students into higher education, but also increasing their diversity. And there is this very bold statement that has been made, which is as follows. The student body entering, participating in, and completing higher education at all levels should reflect the diversity of our populations. Now, at one level, this may seem very bland. You know, we've heard this dozens of times. But when you think about it, this is saying a great deal. In every single country across Europe, Attendance at university is predominantly by white, middle-class people. And so if we're talking about breaking the link between social background, social characteristics, and the opportunity to go to university, this is about really radical change across Europe. And if this were to be achieved, personally, I think this would be absolutely fantastic, but at least it's worth working towards this goal. So we have these things that are to do with widening access, but we also have lots of policy documents that are to do specifically with equalities and disability. We have lots of uh, regulation at European level, lots of national equality legislation, and you'll know about these for your own country. So these things are really fitting together. Overall, the European Union has set the benchmark that 40% of 30 to 34-year-olds should have completed third-level education by 2020. And this figure here is showing the progress that has been made across different countries between 2005, the darker line, and 2013 in the red line. Now, of course, as with all European comparative data, we need to stop and think about what it all means. So you will notice here that third level education or tertiary education is the term that's being used here. This doesn't actually mean university education. It means things that are counted as being at ESCED level four and five. So sub-degree programs as well as degree programs. Sometimes this is misinterpreted as saying that 40% of the population is going to have a degree. That actually isn't what the benchmark is about. And it's also the case that countries have different standards, different criteria about what counts as a third level qualification. You'll see that there are actually really marked differences here in rates of participation across Europe. And some countries, 
that don't have a lot of money, like Romania, for example, are developing from a fairly low base. But some rich countries, like Germany, don't have quite such high levels of participation as you might expect. And partly this is because Germany has really strict standards of what counts as a tertiary level qualification. And some qualifications that would be seen in other countries as being tertiary level in Germany are not counted in this way. So again, you need always to be looking at things data quite critically to underpick, you know, to pick out what is underpinning the way in which the data have been collected, what do they mean? Another issue in making these types of comparison across Europe is that there are very different understandings about what counts as a non-traditional student in different countries, and even more so about who should be counted as a disabled student, what types of impairment count as you being disabled. And so you can see here that different countries are looking at different measures when they're trying to put in place widening access programs. Um, quite surprisingly, not all countries are taking into account socioeconomic status. Disability is only being focused on in 17 jurisdictions, according to what the governments are telling us at the moment and even fewer jurisdictions are focusing on migrant status and ethnic, cultural, linguistic minority status. And the overall conclusions about the Bologna process and its social dimension is that it's been not that successful in terms of really pushing forward the inclusion of underrepresented groups. Countries haven't gathered the data that they need in order to examine how they're doing over time. And because the countries are so different, it's almost impossible to make reliable cross-country comparisons. So there is really a lot more work to be done there, I think. One of the useful sources of data that we do have is the Euro Student Survey. This is a survey that's been conducted by Dominic Orr and colleagues at the University of Hanover. And this is based on student self-report. And it gives us some insight into the type of students who are being included in different university systems across Europe and the types of difficulties that they may be experiencing. So based on student self-report, you can see again that we have really quite different rates of participation in different countries. And of course, across the bottom, some of you will be familiar with the country acronyms, <clears throat> but you will notice that this is going actually, taking quite a broad sweep across Europe, and it's including some countries that you might not associate with being part of Europe. I mean, Russia features in there, for example, so it's actually European higher education area rather than EU member states seen more narrowly. Um, and Again, you will see that the Netherlands is right up there at the top. Um, other countries have much, Montenegro, for example, Romania, have much lower rates of participation. Um, the other thing that you can draw from this figure, I think, is that most people who say that they have an impairment, most students who say that they have a difficulty, see this as not being a major obstacle to their studies. It's a minority that are reporting that this is a major obstacle, a big obstacle. And this probably tells us something about the type of disabled person that is being included. Generally speaking, up until now, universities have been more successful in including students who don't require too many adjustments, maybe students with specific learning difficulties, certainly not students who require major adjustments of the environment, both in terms of teaching and learning and the physical environment. So now turning to this comparison I said I was going to make between Sweden and Scotland, it's interesting to look at these countries because both of them have a long-standing commitment to trying to include as many people as possible in higher education and to increase in diversity. They've done it in slightly different ways, though. Sweden, and my colleague here will know more about Sweden, so he will probably put me right if I say anything that's completely wrong. But um, 
Sweden has developed a system which has put a hub at Stockholm University, which is charged with collating data for Sweden and then distributing money, funding, to institutions. And most institutions in Sweden do have a disabled students coordinator, although it seems that many students at the universities say that they don't have much to do with this coordinator. So, of course, having somebody in place doesn't guarantee that adjustments are being made. Sweden hasn't gone down the, the route, as the UK has done, of using benchmarks targets, indicators, and so on. It's very much left up to institutions to decide what they want to do. In the UK and Scotland, we've had rather tighter regulation. Um, data on each institution's performance has been collated by the Higher Education Funding Council for England annually, and institutions have been benchmarked against comparative institutions, primarily in relation to socioeconomic um, inclusion, but also in relation to ethnicity, disability, and so on. Um, and we've had a tightening of regulation in the UK. Institutions, both in England and in Scotland, are obliged to submit annual widening access outcome agreements um, to say what they're doing in relation to different groups of underrepresented students, and they are obliged to demonstrate progress over time. If they do not do this, then potentially they could incur quite significant financial penalties. Now, of course, some universities are not particularly keen on this, but it is undoubtedly the case that it puts them under some pressure to make changes. And of course, regulation systems like this do have problems. They are very prone to gaming by institutions who can handpick the type of disabled students who are going to be not too difficult to accommodate. But nonetheless, I think the UK and Scotland are examples of where regulation has been used and has been tightened over the years to encourage <coughs> compliance. So I'm going to tell you something about the outcomes of the UK approach. How successful has it been? Well, this table here shows its UK data joined from the Higher Education Statistic Agency. And it shows that there has been a big increase in the proportion of disabled students in higher education over time. Um, you'll see, if you look at the very bottom row, the increase from 1994 to 95. Let me just have a little look. Yes, it went up from 3.6 to 11.6 percent. So that is really quite a significant increase. That's the proportion of disabled students as a proportion of the total student body in universities. But when you look at the categories, you can learn some very, very interesting lessons about who is being included. If you look at the second row, for example, that shows specific learning difficulties. In 94-95, students who disclosed a specific learning difficulty made up just over 16% of the total disabled student population in universities. And by 2013-14, they made up more than 50% of the total student, disabled student body. In some universities, like mine, they make up more than 60% of the total population of disabled students. If you look at the severe low incidence categories, blind, partially sighted, multiple disabilities, personal care support, you will find that we have much lower rates of participation, which partly reflects their proportion in the wider population. But I think it also suggests that we haven't seen growth in this area. And indeed, in relation to blind partially sighted, we see that they make up a decreasing proportion of the total student body. Um, of course, part of this is to do with how understandings of categories change over time. So unseen disability, for example, students are much less likely to put themselves in that category now. There's clearly been a shift between unseen disability and dyslexia. Um, by the way, this paper is available, and I'm quite happy for it to be circulated. So I do appreciate that when numbers are being skipped over, you can't really digest them. So if you have the paper afterwards, then you can have a further look at this data. But a really important message, I think, to take away from this is that we're not doing a particularly good job in including disabled students 
from less socially advantaged backgrounds. When we look at the school population, we find there is an association across all categories of impairment between social disadvantage and being identified as having some sort of special or additional support need. But when we look at the university population, we find that students generally come from the more privileged parts of society. In this figure here, we use the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, SIMD, which is a measure of neighbourhood deprivation rather than individual student deprivation. There are some problems with it, but it's the preferred indicator of the Scottish Government. And so you can see very clearly that the profile of disabled and non-disabled students is actually very similar, um, that if you live in a more advantaged neighbourhood, SIMD 3 to 5, you are much more likely to be in university than if you don't, uh, than if you live in a poorer area. Um, in Scotland also, we have a hierarchy of universities. That's true across the UK. In Scotland, the hierarchy happens to be the ancient universities, the four with the medieval roots. Then we have old universities that are the other pre-92 universities. And then we have new universities that are post-92. These were created from former polytechnic type institutions. And what we find is that if you live in a poorer area, you are more likely to be go to, going to one of the new universities than one of the ancient universities. But exactly the same pattern is exhibited for disabled and non-disabled students. So if you are in a more privileged part of Scotland, a, more, a richer part of Scotland, you're much more likely to be going to university in the first place, but also to be going to one of the highly selective institutions. And this is true for both disabled and non-disabled groups. Exactly the same problems occur. Um, but we do find interesting variations by types of impairment. So we find, for example, that in relation to SPLD, which is the third group of bars from the right, dyslexia, we find that this group of students are particularly socially advantaged they're likely to be living in the most advantaged parts of Scotland. More than three quarters of them are from the most advantaged parts of Scotland. If we look at mental health difficulties or physical mobility difficulties, we find that those students are not quite as socially advantaged as the ones with specific learning difficulties. So that raises lots of questions for us. And in fact, the UK has created a system where there are some advantages for people to disclose having dyslexia. For example, things like extra time in examinations. Um, traditionally, you have been able to get a laptop computer to work with and so on. So we have actually encouraged people to disclose dyslexia, it is a much less stigmatised category than it used to be, and we've made it relatively easy for the, well, easier for those students to get into universities, sometimes with slightly lower entry requirements. But there is a real problem for students with different types of impairment, particularly physical mobility difficulties from poorer parts of Scotland who may not enjoy those sorts of advantages. Now, I don't want to imply that life is a bed of roses for dyslexic students. That is absolutely not the case. But we do have to take into account where they're coming from and what their experiences are. This, very briefly, is a comparison of student dropout rates. Um, comparing different underrepresented groups. And again, you'll need a little bit more time to look at this more closely. But what we do find is that um, if you come from the poorest parts of Scotland and you're in university, if you're disabled, if you're male, you are more likely to drop out than if you um, don't have those types of characteristics, if you're more advantaged, if you're not disabled, and so on. So we need, I think, to take a close account not only of who gets into university, but how they are enabled to stay there. And of course, the reason I am presenting these data for Scotland and the UK is that actually we have very good data that we can work with. 
And this is not the case for the vast majority of European countries who need to do a lot more work to have these types of data available. One of the very good news stories is that once disabled people get into university, the picture is relatively rosy. They have almost as good employment rates as non-disabled students. So if you look at the blue line, people moving into full-time work after university, you will see that disabled students are slightly less likely to be moving into employment than non-disabled students. But it's not a very marked gap. And in fact, deaf and hearing impairment students have almost the same rates of employment as non-disabled students. Deaf and hearing impaired students have actually good rates of employment after graduation. Um, and we can break down by different categories to look at how different groups fare. In fact, we find that people with mental health difficulties tend to struggle a little bit more in getting, graduate, getting and keeping graduate level jobs. Of course, if you look at the population who don't go to university, you find that they have much worse employment rates overall, but the gap between disabled and non-disabled people is much, much wider. Disabled people with few or no qualifications are absolutely in what has been called the precariat, people who are living a very marginalised existence, struggling to get any sort of inclusion in the labour market at all. I am coming to the end, and you've listened very patiently, so thank you. I'm not going to go into the case studies. I didn't think I'd have time, and I don't. But I did want to say that when we look closely at the lives of disabled students in university, we find that social class and its advantages has a very strong protective effect. Disabled students from middle-class backgrounds are generally able to draw on their parents' economic social and cultural capital to protect them. Even though they do get disabled students allowance and support in that way, their parents provide them additional support for living expenses and so on. Um, they also have parents who often intervene in their behalf. They've often been to university themselves. They actually often come to the university to negotiate support on behalf of their offspring. And if things go wrong, they're very quick to dive in and help their, their young people. They also have the social networks which help them to get internships and future employment. So the protective effects of social advantage for that group of disabled students goes right through school, university and into the labour market. But we find the reverse for people who don't have those sorts of advantages, whose parents don't understand the system, who are navigating it by themselves, who don't have the family traditions, the networks and so on, and who are certainly not getting the financial support from their parents to see them through university. And these students are much more likely to drop out and have far greater needs that often universities at the moment are not addressing as well as they could because the focus in widening access generally is getting students into university but not necessarily giving them much support once they're there. So to draw a conclusion or some conclusions. Um, I'll do this briefly because I've already made this point. But you can see that we've had this marked expansion of higher education systems across Europe. And in the UK, at least we can see that this expansion has also applied to disabled students who now are much greater numerically, but also as a proportion of the student body. And this has been supported by policy rhetoric, but also by a tightening regulatory framework. And I'm very well aware that there are upsides and downsides of regulation. If it becomes pointless bureaucracy, box ticking, then it's not much use. But if it's holding to account, then I think it can be useful and it can really underpin and promote social justice goals. We need to pay much more attention, I think, in the Scotland and the UK, and probably across Europe as well, to this type of intersectional analysis that doesn't just look at disabled students as a siloed group, but takes into account all of their social characteristics as well. So lessons for the future. We have to have the policy rhetoric, the grand policy rhetoric, underpinned by robust data gathering systems. 
I know that big data are very often flawed. We must always understand how the data have been gathered, what the categories mean, and so on, as I've tried to illustrate. But without data, we have no idea what progress we're making and whether we're going backwards in some areas. Targets and benchmarks may encourage change. I actually am quite a believer in them, but I think that they can also be misused as well. Um, Additional resources, that's a point I didn't bring out so much in relation to Sweden and the UK, but the UK has targeted extra resources both on institutions and on individual disabled students through the Disabled Students Allowance. Sweden has targeted institutions. I think it's quite important to do both, actually. Um, social class, however it's measured and whatever it's called, remains the strongest predictor of participation in universities. So whatever we do for disabled students, we cannot ignore this dimension. And of course, the context of Europe, as we all know, is a bit depressing at the moment. It's not really about expansion, growth, and so on. It's all about managing austerity. And we have to be careful that progress that we clearly have made in relation to inclusion generally and for disabled people more specifically is not lost. We can't just be looking at what's going to be in the economic interest because sometimes you may struggle in relation to some disabled people to say this is clearly going to be really useful um, economically, although of course it is useful to have more disabled people who are able to participate in the labour market. But we have to make sure that we don't lose sight of the social justice agenda that must always run alongside the economics agenda. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sheila, for your interesting overview of uh, current uh, situation on this area. Uh, you will have the opportunity for questions later on today. Uh, just before lunch, I will allocate at least half an hour for questions uh, from the audience, not only to Sheila Riddell, but also to the other panelists. So I, I would like to postpone the opportunity for questions to uh, a later time. Um, and also, again, we will take care that all the data and presentations from today will be uh, included in one way or another in our final report that we are making uh, on this area in the coming months. So you will be having all the data and, and tables, etc. Now we will have a bit of... Um, well, thank you again for your presentation. Now we will have a little shift here on this top table. Uh, with some challenges uh, which we will solve. Uh, we will have a presentation from uh, a, di a dialogue between uh, Pablo Pineda and Francisco Mezonero. Uh, this will be a dialogue I've heard in Spanish, but there will be interpretation, so you will be informed in English uh, what's going on. I have no, I'm, I'm really, I have no clue what's going to happen, so we look forward to it. In this in this dialogue, um, Pablo uh, will provide um, insights into his personal uh, experiences with regard to studying in, studying in higher education and the challenges he was uh, facing and the support he received. And I, I guess you all know who Pablo is um, since we met him not so long ago in one of our uh, agency events uh, in 2013, I think, in the autumn. Um, Pablo Pineda is a teacher, uh, a writer, and also an actor, a Spanish actor, uh, awarded for the prize of the best actor at the San Sebastian International Film Festival of 2009 for his role in the film Me Too. I don't know if you've seen the film, but I recommend you to, to see the movie. I just had the opportunity not so long ago to see this very uh, interesting uh, movie where he is the, the big actor, actually. Um, he, he is recognized all over Europe and maybe also outside Europe as mainly because he's the first European um, with a Down syndrome who has completed a career at the university. And uh, he's from Malaga, right? 
and he gives lectures and presentations on disability and, and experiences throughout the world, basically to, to remove prejudice and to increase understanding of how to cope with differences among people. Um, since 2010, he has been working with the ADECO Foundation, uh, focusing on awareness rising and training for public uh, business and in society in general. And very recently, he wrote a book, 2015. The book, uh, it's, it's his second book actually, which is titled Children with Special Needs, a Handbook for Parents. He is accompanied today with uh, by Mr. Francisco Mezzonero, uh, who is among many other tasks, also the managing director of the ADECO Foundation. Well, this is the ADECO Foundation is a non-profit organization that focuses on employment for people who, for various reasons, are faced with great difficulties in, in finding a job. And to meet uh, the objective of the ADECO Foundation. The Foundation team has the support of more than 400 ADECO officers, actually, with many resources, and, and they have a deep knowledge of the business world. Well, um, we will have now to uh, shift uh, this top table. Do we have all to move away, or can we stay? Okay. Sit on this side, or you, you can go in the audience uh, if you want. If you are yeah, yeah, later yeah. on, we have the panel completely. Yeah. So are we ready to start? So please, Mr. Pineda and Ms. Ms. Nero, your di dialogue, please. Me dijeron no. Pese, no vas a conseguirlo. Nunca saldrás de esta cama. No puedes. No sabes nadar. Deja de soñar. Soñé. Me imaginé ganando y gané. Rompí mi chiquita. Lo logré. Pruébate. No hay paredes. Pégalas. Solo son puertas. Tú tienes la llave para abrirlas. Buenos días a todos. Eh, Esta es el, digamos, la campaña que el año pasado lanzamos desde la Fundación ADECO, el Día Internacional de la Discapacidad. 
So, good morning, everybody. This is, these slides are referring to the campaign that uh, we have been running last year uh, in order to face the problem of disability. Bien, con respecto a los datos de, de la situación de, de las personas con discapacidad en España, eh, tienen la transparencia que les muestro. As far as the data concerning the disability, the situation of disabled people in Spain, we have got here some slides to show you. Y el dato más llamativo es que tan solo el 6% del total de personas con discapacidad estudia la universidad. And the most important data that we have to deal with is that just 6% of people with disability are in the university. Lo que vamos a intentar a lo largo de nuestra exposición es eh, conocer de primera mano, con un diálogo con Pablo Pineda, cómo él, de alguna forma, ha ido superando barreras y, finalmente, ha terminado sus estudios universitarios encontrando posteriormente un empleo. So, uh, the, the first point we're going to deal with is uh, to start a dialogue with uh, uh, Pablo in order to know what his experience is as uh, regards, uh, um, the, uh, as regards his, the, the, his study at the, at the university and how he could face the problems and uh, how he has been able to approach the, to approach the uh, labor system. Pablo, porque tú no descubres eh, que tienes síndrome de Down hasta los 11 años. Hablamos de hace más de 30 años y ya estamos completamente integrados en el colegio. ¿Cómo se desarrolla tu infancia y tu paso por el colegio? Um, you, uh, you do not know anything about your Down syndrome until uh, you were uh, 11 years old and it happened 30 years uh, ago. Um, so, what about your approach? What about your studies? En general, mi infancia y mi, y mi paso por el colegio fue una época muy bonita. My experience has been excellent when, in, when we um, talk about my childhood. En la que no éramos compañeros, éramos amigos. Sorry. We, we, we're all friends uh, at school. Y, y, y los profesores pues eran... Eh, me aceptaron como uno más en sus clases. Um, oh, well, they, they gave me uh, wonderful consideration in uh, the teacher uh, gave me a good consideration in in the classes. Al principio tenía ciertos apoyos. I, I uh, at the beginning of uh, my studies I was needing some support. Pero poco después los profesores ya exigieron que me quedara en en clase, con lo cual. Eh, fue una experiencia pues, compartida con todos. ¿no? It, it, it has been quite a difficult experience, as I was saying at the beginning, but then the teacher had met me and uh, just uh, started to have a, a communication and a relationship with me. ¿Tu vida cambia cuando descubres que eres diferente al resto de tus compañeros? Did your life change when you understood that you had a difference vis-à-vis -vis your colleagues? Generalmente mi vida no cambió cuando descubrí la diferencia. No, it didn't change when uh, I understood that I had a difference. Al contrario, me reforzó para seguir haciendo cosas. I I I tried to uh, strengthen my experience in order to try to face all the different experiences of my life. Porque creo que la diferencia enriquece allá por donde va. Because I think that difference is quite is something very very important, uh, um, uh, notwithstanding what the uh, what the what the direction of your life is. Tras el paso por el colegio llegas al instituto y todo cambia. Es distinto en un entorno que no está preparado para asumir las diferencias. So after the secondary school, you, um, you went to the university, and uh, I would like to know whether your experience, wh what do you think about that experience? I mean, is, is it difficult to get in touch with some institution that are not ready to accept and to uh, face the problem of a disability? Hombre, hay que partir de, de que el instituto ya no es el colegio, ¿no? Well, the, 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 the institution I was, uh, we were, we're talking about is not a college, it's not a school. Ya no es esa institución protectora, ¿no? It, it is an institution that uh, um, represents the shield for you, that protects you. 
tienes que demostrar a tus compañeros y a tus profesores que puedes estar ahí. And you have to show, you have to demonstrate to your colleagues and to the teachers that you are able to be there. Estamos hablando de 1990, con lo cual el hecho de ser el primer chico en aquel entonces con síndrome de Down en un instituto a nivel de Europa, pues condiciona. We are talking about the, uh, we are about talking about 1990. So I was the first student getting in this institution. So I had to demonstrate that I was able to do to to uh, carry on this experience. ¿Qué tipo de apoyo y orientación tuviste a la hora de decidir si querías aprender una profesión o estudiar? What kind of support did you receive when you decided to study for a profession? Bueno, eh, uno de mis niños siempre quiere tener tiene aspiraciones, ¿no? You have a lot of aspirations, of course. Quería ser prim, historiador, periodista, abogado. I wanted to study history. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a journalist. Pero un señor profesor de universidad, don Miguel López Melero, me dijo, Pablo, lo tuyo no es eso, porque es muy competitivo, lo tuyo es hacer magisterio. Um, but uh, a professor I was uh, in touch with uh, said to me, um, Pablo, this is not your cup of tea. Uh, you have to deal with a professional teacher. Ah, y cuando llegas a la universidad, ¿por qué decides estudiar eh, magisterio y siempre ent entró en tus planes? Was it uh, when you when you go to the university uh, was studying for being a professor uh, professor um, your uh, belonging to your uh, plans? Have you already decided to do that? Hombre, yo 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 de pequeño y de adolescente no pensaba en llegar. A la, a la universidad. I was not thinking to uh, get at the university. Pensaba que lo más importante era el día a día, ¿no? I, I was trying to, I mean, to, to run my daily life. Pero este señor, don Miguel López Pelero, fue el que con, con esa elección de magisterio hizo que entrara en la universidad. But this person I was talking about said to me that uh, it was my cup of tea that I had to study for being a professor, a teacher. ¿Cuáles han sido los retos más grandes a los que has tenido que hacer frente cuando empezaste a estudiar en la universidad? What kind of challenges that did you have to tackle and to face when you decided to study at university? El principal reto cuando llegué a la universidad, como cuando estoy en sociedad, es intentar demostrar a la gente, a, a la universidad, que podía hacer una carrera. Uh, well, my the main challenge I had to face when I got at the university is to show people that I was able to do it. También fui el primer chico universitario en Europa hace ya 20 años. Um, I, I repeat, we talk about uh, many, many years ago, 20 years ago, and so I was the first guy getting get, get, get at the university. Con lo, con lo cual, había que demostrar a los compañeros de la institución universitaria que un síndrome de Down podía estar ahí con el resto. And uh, I had to show, I had to demonstrate either to colleagues and to professors, to teachers, that a person with Down syndrome was able to carry on this career, to study there. Ya os digo yo que eso es mucho más difícil que estudiar. And this fact, the, the, the need to show that, has been much more difficult than studying. Y durante tu paso por la universidad, ¿quién te apoyó más? ¿La universidad, tu entorno, tu familia? Uh, where, during, during your stay at the university, uh, what uh, kind of institution or, or, or person did give you much more support? Who have, been, who have you been supported by? Bueno, fue, 
como, como, como diría, una labor en conjunto, ¿no? Yeah, this kind of award has been uh, carried out jointly. Primero, por supuesto, mi familia. First of all, of course, my family. Luego, este señor, don Miguel López Melero, que fue el que me introdujo. And I repeat again, the person I was talking about, unfortunately, Mr. Miguel López Melero is the person that supported me the most. Y luego la propia institución universitaria y sobre todo su profesorado. And, and also the institution uh, supported me very much. All the, the, the teachers supported me very much. ¿Crees que la formación es el primer paso hacia la normalización de las personas con discapacidad? Do you think the training is the first important step for a person with disability? No solo lo creo, sino que además lo aseguro. Of course, I do not only believe that it is, but I can assure you that it is this way. Creo que para poder normalizar a un colectivo como el síndrome de Down, hay que estar especialmente formados. If you, if you need to address people with the Down syndrome, you have to be properly trained. Porque es nuestra gran forma de demostrar nuestra valía al resto de la sociedad. It is the, the best way to show the community what our value is and why we are, the, we are important. En, con la experiencia de Pablo, que, que trabaja y es empleado en, en la Fundación ADECO, pues, well, through the experience uh, carried out by, uh, by um, Pablo and his connection with the ADECO Foundation, pusimos en marcha en España hace tres años un programa que es el programa Unidos. We, um, we, we figured out in Spain three years ago a program under the title of Unidos en donde participan ocho universidades y 26 grandes compañías eh, del mundo de la tecnología. In this program, uh, um, we have the participation of eight universities and 26 important institutions dealing with the world of information and technology. El objetivo es que estudiantes de último curso eh, o de los dos últimos cursos universitarios hicieran prácticas laborales en esas compañías. What, what is the main goal of, of that? Is that to allow people um, a, a, about to be graduated to have the possibility to be trained and to uh, work in these companies? Y en cada una de esas compañías existe la figura del mentor, del coach, que acompaña en todo momento a esa persona con discapacidad. And in all these universities and institutions, we have the profile of what we call the coach that support people in order to run their activities. Bueno, Pablo, y después de terminar eh, tu su estudio universitario, ¿hacia dónde enfocaste tu carrera profesional? After after uh, finalizing your university, uh, what kind of purpose did you want to, did you want to uh, be addressed to? What, what kind of goal did you want to achieve? Fueron distintas, distintas facetas, ¿no? Um, many different uh, nuances, many different uh, uh, points of view. La primera fue en la administración pública de mi ciudad, de Málaga. First of all, public administration in my city, the city of Málaga. Ahí trabajaba como orientador o preparador laboral de personas con discapacidad. And I try to, uh, to, to, to deal with the problem of disability in my, in, my, in my city. A partir de ahí empecé a, a salirme otras facetas que luego ya... Contaremos, ¿no? Como la de actor, presentador. But besides that, I also want to pursue other tasks and to go to uh, deal with other tasks. For instance, uh, I wanted to uh, work as an actor. Y en, en el ayuntamiento de Málaga, tu experiencia siempre fue positiva. What about your experience in Málaga, in the municipality of Málaga? Málaga, has 
your experience always been positive? No, siempre. Al principio, sí. No, 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 honestly, not always. Uh, at the beginning, yes, it was. Porque me relacionaba con el mundo asociativo malagueño. I had to deal with the a word of association in Malaga. Pero después eh, fueron, se hizo un proyecto general. Uh, but, but later on, a general project has been started. Con personas en riesgo de exclusión. Um, for people in a situation of risk of exclusion. Y me quedé en labores meramente burocráticas, de papeleo. So, uh, I had to uh, address the problem of bureaucracy. I had to deal with a lot of favor. Habían desaprovechado clar claramente mi talento. So, um, my, my value had not been appreciated enough. Después eh, tuviste una experiencia como actor en donde, como se ha comentado, ganaste la concha de plata en San Sebastián. ¿Cómo llegaste a ser actor? El proceso fue largo. It was a very, very long process. Primero, me, me, primero me, pro, me, me propusieron la idea de ser actor. First of all, they, I, I, I received the proposition to work as an actor. Y me generaron, me generaron un cierto debate en mí mismo y en mi familia. And honestly, I had a lot of concern. I was quite worried about that, so even at personal level and also as regards my relationships with my family. Pues era un cambio muy importante. It has been a very important and outstanding change in my life. Después me convenció la sensibilidad con que se iba a hacer la película. The, the, then I was convinced for um, the need of, I mean, of how important that was to work for this movie. Porque tanto el productor como uno de los directores tienen familiares con síndrome de Down. Um, Even because I would like to highlight the fact that uh, either the uh, producer and the directors and the director of this uh, movie um, have uh, people with disability in their family. Y actualmente, eh, Pablo, como os comentaba, trabaja en, en la Fundación ADECO en un papel muy importante que es el de sensibilizar a las empresas. Um, as we were saying now, you're working together with the ADECA Foundation, and your task uh, in the framework of ADECA Foundation is very, very important because your task is an awareness, awareness making uh, uh, campaign, an awareness making task uh, with other people. Porque después de 23 años de experiencia en recursos humanos eh, en mi persona, Because um, I have been working uh, for 23 years uh, in uh, the uh, human resources department of my company. El problema no es que las personas con discapacidad sean discriminadas o no. But I could say that the real problem we have to address is not dealing with discrimination uh, for disabled people, vis-a-vis -vis disabled people. El problema es que existen muchas barreras mentales barreras humanas y estereotipos porque la sociedad no conoce bien las personas con discapacidad. The real problem we have to face in these terms uh, is represented by the existence of many obstacles and many barriers and also many biases uh, concerning disability. Y en ese sentido yo quisiera preguntarle a Pablo en qué consiste tu trabajo en tu labor de sensibilización. And in these terms, uh, I would like to ask a question uh, to Pablo. I would like exactly what your uh, awareness-making task is dealing with. What do you do exactly for the awareness-making? Bueno, mi labor en Fundación ADECO es la de intentar concienciar a las empresas, sobre todo a los trabajadores de dichas empresas. 
my main task uh, in the framework of ADEC Foundation is uh, to raise awareness in the different companies and almost uh, in the different workers of these companies. Intentarles hacerles ver que lo que hay ahí son personas con mucho talento. It is important for me to show these people that people with disability working in these institutions and these companies have a very important added value. Talento que sea, talento que sea desconocido y que se sigue desconociendo. It is a value of it, these people that people do not know and people uh, uh, still is ignorant about this, uh, are, are ignorant about this problem. Siempre escondido en un mensaje altamente negativo. Un mensaje negativo, que, que no ah, puede. Yeah, yeah uh, the, the message we we'll receive is usually negative. Por, por tanto, yo les digo, apostad por nosotros. Danos esa oportunidad de estar en sociedad. The, and my message, the, the message I, want, I would like to spread out there is uh, this is an important chance for you. This is an important chance for you to uh, be integrated in uh, our society. Porque para nosotros la única posibilidad de estar en sociedad es a través del empleo. Because the only possibility we have, the only chance we have to be really strongly integrated in our society is working. Y por último, Pablo, sí. eh, ¿cuál es eh, tu sueño o qué es lo que tú le pides a la vida? Well, but last but not least, I would like to ask a question to Pablo. I would like to know what is your dream? What is, what are your expectations vis-à-vis your life? Bueno, mi único sueño es algún día ver a todos los síndromes de Down de este mundo, en, estando, estando donde ahora estáis vosotros, ¿no? Uh, uh, my, uh, my, my real dream is that in the future we could see all people with Down syndrome really integrated in this kind of community, among people like you. Que, trabajando, mm, mm, trabajando en las, empe en las empresas, And I repeat, the main goal is keep working in enterprises and companies. Que tenga los mismos derechos que cualquier persona. Um, people with uh, Down syndrome must have the same rights as anybody else. Y que al final mi caso no siga siendo noticia. Yeah, and, and I want that in my case, my experience, uh, do not represent the only experience, the only case. Sino que la sociedad no vea como algo tan normal y tan natural, tan my, natural. My case and my experience should be considered by society as something absolutely normal. Y por supuesto que yo lo vea. <laughs> And uh, of course, uh, I would like to uh, to see this dream uh, become true. <laughs> Por eso es, me gustaría ver decir, hombre, aquí, la, hombre que está, está, está trabajando en HP, hoy oh, qué bien, qué interesante. <laughs> and I would like to see, uh, for instance, uh, uh, this kind of circumstance, uh, just say people saying, oh my God, you're working in a certain company, that's good, well done. O, o ser concejala. No, de un, de un, de un ayuntamiento. And, 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 and also being awarded by a municipality. O quien sabe, mi, mi, ministro <coughs> o ministra del gobierno. And maybe in the future I would like uh, uh, to work uh, in a municipality and I would like to become a minister. Yo creo que, yo creo que si fuésemos ministros, el mundo iría, iría, iría de forma distinta. <laughs> I think that if we were ministries, uh, uh, the world would follow a different path, a different way forward. <laughs> Gracias por estar, por escucharme. Gracias por escucharnos. Gracias por por venir a un sitio tan con tanto poder, ¿no? 
Uh, I would like to heartily uh, thank you for being here, for listening to me, for your attention, and thank you for inviting me inside a beautiful place, an important place. Para mí, y ya, y ya termino, Italia es como si fuera mi casa, por ser un país al que he visitado muchísimo. Um, Italy is a very important country for me. It is time like uh, it is my home uh, actually, and I've been here several times. Al cual he venido en diversos congresos, jornadas, durante los últimos 25 años. Um, in the last 25 years, I've been uh, working several times here in Italy. I've been participating in many seminars, in many workshops. Me estuvo escuchando gente de toda Europa, ¿no? No es fácil. And it, it is so nice to see to see people coming from all over Europe. Que mi voz se clame a nivel europeo, ¿no? Eso es muy importante. It is. It would be so important to, to let my voice be been, uh, be heard by many many people in the world in in the in Europe. Que en Europa cale también las las ideas y los valores sociales. Uh, mm, in, 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 in Europe, uh, we uh, need to strengthen what uh, social values are. Frente a los puramente económicos. And uh, they must, this, uh, this social values uh, must be more important than economic values. Y la idea de que hay que invertir en sectores claves como la educación. And... A nivel, uh, we have to invest in key points, like, for instance, education. El futuro no, no está en recortar, está en invertir. Our future, in, in our future, we cannot cut off. Y eso hay que decirlo aquí. Y eso hay que decirlo aquí, en Europa. Uh, we have to invest. And this is the perfect place where to have to have to, to raise this awareness because people must uh, know that that we have not to cut off but uh, we have to invest. Muy bien, pues yo creo que lo más importante de, de todo y habrá muchas cosas que se han quedado en el tintero es eh, saber si alguien tiene alguna pregunta que hacerle a Pablo o a mí. Beside, beside what uh, Pablo has uh, just said, I would like to ask the audience whether there are some uh, uh, questions to ask uh, Pablo. Well, maybe I can <clears throat> interfere. We will now have a, a coffee break, and then at the end of the next session, we will have the opportunity to uh, raise questions. But if I may, I'm at the top table, so I can ask a question maybe. This, this movie, um, uh, I know, Pablo, you understand a bit of English. Um, the movie, Yo Tambien, uh, is it? Uh, it was on the Dutch television not so long ago. Is it on YouTube or is, is it a free uh, movie that we can uh, see somewhere? Or do we have to wait until it comes to the uh, television channels? Ahora, yo creo que a nivel europeo ya estará eh, publicado, ¿no? I think that at the European level it has already, the movie has already been published. Además, se ha visto en el cine, se ha visto en el cine en distintos países europeos. It, 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 it has already been possible to see the movie in many European countries. Además, se puede comprar. And it, it, it is all, also possible to buy this movie. Yo prefiero que la compréis. I, I suggest you to buy the movie. <laughs> Pablo, one, one last question. Are you studying at the university right now? Bueno, me quedan cuatro asignaturas de una segunda carrera que es psicopedagogía. Um, I, I have four examinations left before getting the graduation as a, 
um, pedagogist. Pedagogist? Pero la agenda me, no, me impide por, ponerme en profundidad a ello, ¿no? But unfortunately, I'm very, very much uh, busy and uh, it does not allow me to keep uh, studying. A ver si lo compatibilizo y, y lo saco. Um, I, I, I would like to, 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 to match this, uh, this commitment and I would like to finish my career. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Pineda, Mr. Mezunievo, for your dialogue and also the interpreter. I, I don't know your name, but I think you did a fantastic job for, uh, to help this dialogue uh, coming so lively to us. Thank you very Thank much you. again. And now I would like to invite you for a cup of coffee, which is in the other room at the other uh, side of the hallway, and we come back a quarter to 11 in this room. <laughs>